So let's get going. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on and bring on Brother Zen and get into the the Psalms 82. Uh, Sons of God, who are we and why are we here? This is arguably the most exciting mystery in all of the Bible. Praise Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Zen, are you there? I am, brother. How are you doing this evening? Oh man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm I'm so glad that you're you're coming back on to share this. This is the best subject ever. I mean, we have such a large number of people that are moving. You know, they you know some some of the people get pretty knowledgeable. Uh, then they don't, you know, they're they're not as hungry for the information, and so there's motion through all ministries. I know you've seen it in your ministry where you know you had people that are, uh, you know, that were hanging on your every word, and then now you have new people coming in and new questions bubbling up, and we're seeing that here. We're seeing a, a sizable uh, new, a group of new folks. Uh, last show I had mentioned uh, seeing this motion of new folks. And that even some people uh, had not, uh, didn't even realize that 9/11 was an inside job. And sure enough, uh, God bless her, uh, uh, Sister Ann, uh, who is in this area, emailed me. She was surprised. She did not realize that 9/11 was an inside job. Can you believe that, brother? Uh, yeah, brother. Because a lot of people that come to um, your ministry, my ministry, both of the work that we're doing. They have no idea how deep the rabbit hole goes and how um, how much information we bring forth. Because uh, we've been on for a lot of years now. I've been on since 2008. And so that's a number of different shows that we've covered. And um, the, sometimes whatever it is that brings them, that leads them to find us, is just the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, the full summation as far as the work that we've done and all of the topics and issues that we've covered. Um, and many of them, you know, have not even begun to dive into the uh, the archives and the, the full amount of work um, that, you know, we've done and, and Jonathan Cleck and all of our associations and um, in our collaborations together and being confirming witness for one another. And a lot of times the, the those that have just heard one or two shows are the most excited. And, you know, it, rather than having uh, listened to a lot of the archives and not even becoming aware of all that is out there, they will ask a dozen questions just because they're so new to this information and uh and are so excited about the things that they are learning but the, you know they have no idea especially for those that are just beginning to be introduced to some of the esoteric subjects that we cover uh, it's 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 a lot to take in it, it can be overwhelming oh amen kenneth it is uh it is overwhelming and um the thing that I mentioned earlier about truth is a lot of people try to look at truth as just this plainer thing, black and white, uh, right or wrong, up or down. And that led to a lot of the schisms in the church and the whole Protestant movement. But unless you take truth and temper it with the Spirit, and so it's like Jesus said, you know, we're going to worship the Father in spirit and in truth, and the Father seeketh those who worship in spirit and in truth. And then um, Paul told the Ephesians that we have to have truth tempered with love. So unless you're in that spirit, the spirit of the Most High God, this truth that's found in all of these books, especially the sacred canon, this truth is nothing but clanging symbols. So we have to be certain that we're walking in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit and just peppered with his love, and it's oozing out of every pore of our very being, or this truth is going to mislead us. There's another thing that is happening, and I'm sure that both of you are aware of it as well, is that the um, propaganda 
and the disinformation that is being put out by government is so in your face now that even those that have been the most asleep are realizing something is wrong and that we're not being told the truth as a collective, as humanity, uh, as the masses. And so many are now starting to seek alternative than the mainstream media and the you know regurgitation of propaganda daily and nightly on all the news channels by all the talking bobbleheads. And so people are seeking for answer and in earnest, uh, in earnest, yearning for and asking for the truth to be shown to them. And when, you know, when they um, couple those things together, they have no idea as to, you know, what really truth is. And so when the reality uh, begins to uh, present itself to them, it's, you know, it's like opening up a massive can of worms, so... Well, you know, okay, so let's, amen, and and so let's take a look at this. Um, oh, and before we proceed, for the for those of you who are new to these concepts, you might say, well, why why, why do we care? Well, because here's why. Other than the fact that that the scripture says in Proverbs twenty five verse two that it is the glory of our heavenly Father God. It is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. So the Father expects us to search out his mysteries. We're supposed to do it with a humble and contrite heart and as good Bereans, searching through the Bible daily to see if it is so. But we're also commanded to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And you can't really become wise as a serpent by sticking to just the 66 book canon and that's what's happening today people are waking up they're finding out that 9-11 was an inside job they're finding out that uh you know the oklahoma city bombing was was not was was uh, it's a setup okay they're finding out that the war on terror is a setup they're finding out that there's fema camps they're finding out all these things and that we are on the precipice of the Great Tribulation, that the United States is destroyed and that the Antichrist is running this country, or Obama or whoever. You know, some of us believe that. I believe it. Now, you might say, well, I don't believe any of that stuff. I, you know, why is this important? Why are we talking about this? All right, well, here's the really, really big reason. If you are sitting, you know, we're, our job amongst many other things, if we are to be obedient to our King, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus. And I pray that you are trying to be obedient. Is you're supposed to be winning souls and bringing people along to the kingdom. And many people, it says in James one twenty two, it says, Be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving yourself. And many people don't do the word of God at all. So how do you answer the tough questions when you're sitting? You know, here we are entering into the holiday season. Many of us are going to be at Christmas parties, at work. We're going to be around people that we're not normally around. We're going to have opportunities to witness. I just sent out stacks and stacks of Tribulation Now business cards. Okay, if you want some of those for free, just email me at jbaptist777 at gmail.com, and I'll send you a stack of these cards. You can use them to witness. You know, again, aliens, demons, megaquakes, planet X, nuclear war, martial law, New World Order, FEMA camps, it's all on the back of the card. Now, what if somebody says to you these questions? If God really loves us, then why do so many people have to suffer? Next question. If God really loves us, then why doesn't he destroy evil and the devil? Why are some people born into easy lives and other people born into difficult lives? Did all of humanity have to redeem itself because a woman ate a piece of fruit 6,000 years ago? Why are we born into sin? How is it possible we were sinners from before birth? Why is mankind so important to God when there are billions of stars in the universe? 
I feel like I had a past life. Why do I feel like I've existed in a past life? How many people out there have felt like they existed before? Look at the popularity of all that Harry Krishna stuff and, and reincarnation. Why is it so popular? Why are there so many people out there that are convinced that they lived before? What about the visions? These are answers that you cannot these are questions that cannot be answered without seeking the greater mysteries of our Heavenly Father, of our King Jesus. Now, and, and so, so Brother Zen, tell us, what's up with Psalms 82, the divine counsel of God's? What is up with that? Who are those? Explain that whole concept to us. Where did we come from? And, and, and one of the listeners has sent in a question. I'm going to read this to you because it segues into that. Do you and and do you believe that we on earth were all once some type of an angel uh and fallen uh or is it because we have mixed DNA from someone uh, uh mixed or or is it because we have mixed DNA so this individual is asking is it DNA is the issue or were we all at one time some type of an uh, angelic being and ultimately fallen uh, can you can you go ahead and answer the Psalms 82 and that question? Yes, but before I do, I want to um, state that the other aspect of the importance of the things that we're going to be covering here is that there there's this other bloodline on this planet that does not worship the Father and the Son, and that they behind the scenes rule and control. And the prime ministers, the president, uh, the blood royal elite, that they are all dancing on a string to this secret society, this new world order, and that these people are out for your blood, for your children, and they are at every turn of the way waging war against us. And so the whole Hosea um, chapter 6, Verse 4, my people are killed for lack of knowledge. Whether you believe in the New World Order or not, your life is at risk. And your children's lives, your parents' lives, all of us are daily being bomba uh, bombarded by the poisons and the toxins and the things that they are doing, the ulterior measures and motives that they have put into place on every level of society and culture and uh, these current civilizations that we live in, that if you do not know about them and are not aware of the bloodline of Cain and uh, the seed of the serpent, then your life is at risk and you will more than likely assist them just in your daily um, routine and habit of survival here on this planet in helping them to decimate you and your family. And so that's it's very important for people to become aware of these things. And you know, you you said why is this kind of stuff important? Cuz our lives are at risk. And that being said, um yes, we did and had part uh cuz everybody thinks about a lot of New Age teachings, they teach about that, you know, we're reincarnating over lifetimes and that we're coming into flesh embodiment multiple, multiple times. And and people have inside them, they have a feeling that they have existed and that they have been here before their incarnation in the flesh. And so, and, and once you come to understanding about Psalms 82 and the sentence that was pronounced on us in Psalms 82, and you can read it after we go into this, but basically, as sons of God, we were pre-existing with the Father and the Son, and we have been predestinated for special role and mission, and this is one of the biggest secrets of the Word and one of those skeleton keys which helps people to unlock and to understand so much that has been veiled within the scriptures and not just the Old and the New Testament, but all of the extra-biblical and extra-canonical books, including even the 
the Nag Hammadi codices, the Dead Sea Scrolls, and those two massive collections of work uh, that have just recently come to light and that people, most people haven't ever really begun to study and really don't have understanding on. Because unless you have this key and the other one that, you know, there are two bloodlines on this planet and that uh, the line of Cain uh, was born from the fornication, the beguilement of Eve with Satan, so much will continue to be veiled and just will not make sense. But when you can get a grasp and, you know, uh, open yourself to new possibility and then come to discernment, you know, ask the Father and the Son to verify these things for you. And once you are brought to this revelation, then everything will fall into place. And the puzzle of truth that underlies all things will begin to present itself to you in a way that it could not ever have come forward unless you can grasp and comprehend the things that we're talking about now. And once you do, the questions about our pre-existence and our feelings that we have lived um, live, and, and when I speak of life before this, I'm talking about our spiritual incarnations. And when we were, as it says in Psalms 82, part of the council of of the mighty, um, part of the the divine council, the morning star administration, and with the father and the son. And we were also present for and witness to the war in heaven because the enmity that is in existence here on this planet and that will continue through the fullness of the second world age until Christ comes again to separate the wheat and the tares and the goat and the sheep, the wise from the foolish virgins, it will it stems from that war in heaven and the separation of the light and the darkness. One third of the angels of the Most High siding with Lucifer and then the war breaking out. Um, many not doing anything and just watching, not having, uh, not doing anything in such way that they sided with the Father or sided with Satan. And so many that um, kind of were in the middle road, like the lukewarm church of today, the Laodicean church of today, are those that couldn't make decisions, that actually believed that Lucifer was going to have a chance to overthrow the Most High. Because his glory and his... his um, uh, his appeal was so great that you know he he did have one third join him, and many that were uncertain, unsure as to whether he would actually succeed. And so many people that are embodiment that find themselves in flesh now were like those that are the lukewarm, the Laodicean church of this day and this age. The only difference is is you cannot ride the fence anymore. You can't straddle the middle road. You have to make a determination to side with Christ or because if you don't and you just, you know, enjoy and indulge in the comfort and the pleasures and the carnality of this world, you will be spewed out. You you don't you don't you will not get another chance uh for redemption and redeeming. Christ came into the flesh to show us the way. He was the example, uh, the way and the truth and the light. And here we have chance again for that redeeming and to embrace that salvation that was extended to all of us. But you can't just remain in the middle ground anymore. You have to make a choice because otherwise not making a choice will be considered your choice and you will be spewed out like those that are uh, of the wicked. 
So uh, to, to restate that, and oh, first, before I restate the question so you can nail it down, because i got three questions in the queue right now and probably more coming in. Again, folks, if you have questions, send them to TN Radio Show. That's Tribulation Now, TN Radio Show at gmail.com. Praise God. All right, now, and to confirm what Brother Zen, scripturally confirm what Brother Zen just said from the 66 book canon, Revelation 13, verse 8, all those who dwell on the earth will worship him whose names have not been written in the book of life of the Lamb, slain from the foundations of the world. Okay, so the point is that this, there's your scripture that's proof that there are beings, influences, beings, if you will, on this earth that are were never written in the book of life since the foundations of the world. Okay, since the beginning of the world. All right, praise God. There's actually three different dispositions to the book of life. Those who were written in the book of life since before the foundations of the world. Those who were blotted out of the book of life. Okay, that's in Revelation 3, 5. And those who were never in the book of life, Revelation 13, 8. All right, praise God. And the first question, uh, to make sure we cover these good, uh, the, the, one, the person says, do you believe... We on earth were all once angels or angelic beings and fallen, or do you believe it's a mixed DNA issue? No, we were all angels, and we, we are still angels, but we find ourselves residing in flesh form. But that aspect, that part of us that is the connecting link to the Most High, to the Creator, and to the Son, that is the angelic part of us that is immortal, and bright-natured, and that goes on without the flesh. Uh, even in dreaming, we leave these bodies, and we go on into that dreaming world. And, you know, we are not, we're just wearing the flesh almost like as, a, as armor of soul, but it's not who we are. We are not our flesh embodiment. We're, you know, that's part of our identification in this physical world, in this life, and in this embodiment, but that's not essentially who we are. The true part of who we are is that aspect of us that connects us to the Creator and that pre-existed with the Father and the Son before coming into flesh form. Okay, and then the next, uh, and and folks, again, there 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 are so many scriptures that back these things. Uh, again, you can read many many of these scriptures in uh, Angel Wars and the Original Sin Part Two. If you click on that link at tribulation-now.org, as a matter of fact, one of those scriptures, or actually two of them, I'll give them to you real quick, is Jeremiah one verse five. Before I formed you in the womb, I knew you. Before. You were born. I sanctified you. Wow. And then Ephesians 1, 3 through 6. Blessed be the God and Father of the Lord Jesus Christ, who was blessed with us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places uh, in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundations of the world. How is it that Jesus chose us before the foundations of the world? See, it's all over the Bible, but you have to be woke. You have to be led to the discernment, and then when your eyes are open and your spiritual eyes are just wow, and then you have to almost like read the whole Bible all over again. Praise Jesus! And the second question uh, that we have queued up is uh, Psalms eighty-two dot one says, "God standeth in the congregation of the mighty; He judges amongst the gods." Those gods mentioned in this verse and uh are those gods mentioned in this verse, the 24 elders mentioned in Revelation 5.14, aren't they the same? As so this individual, the council of the mighty? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, I'll go ahead and read it to you. I'll quote it. Yeah. Quote, God stands in the congregation of the mighty. He judges amongst the gods. Those, quote, gods mentioned in this verse and those 24 elders mentioned in Revelation 5.14 are the same question mark. Okay, so this individual feels or may have been taught from another source that the 24 elders are the divine counsel of gods. He thinks they're one and the same. Is the, And he's asking, do you, do you agree with that? Um, in my opinion, 
the Council of the Mighty is more than just a mighty few of, as far as that. That the Council includes all of the sons of God, which are all of the angels. Because, you know, it's not, um, even though the Father and the Son have the will to impose whatever it is as far as their wishes, they do... Um, they do ask the opinion of their angels and they you know they they govern much like um a democracy or a republic but their will of course and their wisdom is first and foremost but they do listen to their angels and and they are concerned with what the angels think and what they say and so it's my opinion that the um, Council of the Mighty is the sum total of all the angels of the Most High, that he, that they work um, in, in a way that, you know, everybody's input is important, which, you know, is is a, a, a beautiful way to, you know, because you would want um, input on things that are, are to happen, a special, you know, like, if our government actually listened to the people and listened to um, the things that were important and did things based on uh, the collective goodwill of humanity, so much, you know, but, of course, we don't do things that way. Um, but the Most High, of course, does and is compassionate and is um, judging from that aspect and and. And so the Council of the Mighty, in my opinion, is all of the angels and and um, not just 24 of a select few. Okay, right. Praise God. Um, amen. Um, next question is, uh, do you think everyone is an angel? And if so, what does it mean to be uh, – oh, and folks, this is really important because uh, I'm seeing questions – I'm seeing a, a nuance in, in the questions that are coming in. Praise God. Now, now, real quick, I just want to set a foundation for folks. You have the spirit, okay, and you understand spirit being. So you have this concept of a spirit being, okay, and that would be arguably what we're going to be when we move on to the heavenly realm and become our original light being type forms uh, when we go back. But see, Yea, saith the Lord of hosts. Take a look at your Bible. The Lord of hosts. The Lord of hosts. That's the key. That's the key to understanding these concepts. The Lord of hosts. What's a host? What's a host? See, we've been tricked by, arguably, some of the ambassadors of the devil, if you want to suggest that, but... Angels are not blonde women with harps in their hands and wings. Children, this, these definitions are critical to get your arms around because we've been deceived by our training. An angel is simply a class of a messenger being, but there are many, 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 many different types of, 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 of angelic beings. You could argue, just because we are only familiar with terminology that identifies maybe a half a dozen different classifications of angels, you've got messenger classes, then you've got classes of those classes, you've got entire hierarchies of angelic beings, messenger beings. I don't even like the term angel because it's deceptive in its nature. That's because we've been programmed to think it's something other than it is. All beings that were created by our Heavenly Father in the universe, in the smorgasbord of, of, of life forms in the universe, all beings that were created by our Heavenly Father directly to work on behalf of the Heavenly Office of God are, by definition, sons of God or children of the Most High. All beings. Lucifer is the son of God, by definition. He's a cherubim. Okay? So these are these this hierarchy of beings. And just because we know teraph, teraphim, cherubim, ophanim, uh, ch you know, uh, all these, just be, that doesn't mean that there aren't thousands of other classifications that we're not privy to. Because there are. 
Okay, so that's the important thing is to understand what we're talking about is a classification of being, being that was created by our Heavenly Father. And then you have the spirit essence of that being, the light being, the spirit essence, and then you have the host body. Yea, saith the Lord of hosts. Host body. See, when you die, your what? Spirit leaves your body. See, okay, then you are in a host body. Right? Okay, that's these are concepts that are very important because when it says in Psalms eighty two that ye shall die like men and fall like one of the princes, what that means is the Father cast a judgment down upon those gods, those minor gods. Okay? So there you go. There's proof positive that sons of God, children of the most high, that were created by God could be injected into a host body and ultimately die like men. That's what that means. Okay, so in our present state, we are not just human. We are way more than that. We spirit, soul, body. It's far bigger than that. And those concepts are really important because people get confused. They say things like, you know, we are appointed to die once and then uh, face uh, uh, judgment. Um, but, but see, you have to understand that there are scriptures that are referring to us before the foundations of the earth, before we were incarnated into the host body as a human. So you have to read the scriptures with two understandings. One is the scripture is applicable to us in our human state, and the other is, oh, the scripture is applicable to us in our before the foundations of the earth state. See? There's a duplicitous nature to the scriptures. Lines upon lines, precepts upon precepts. Praise Jesus. Okay, uh, well said, then, thank you very much. God bless you. So do you think everyone is a uh, son of God slash angelic being at one time? You know, And if so, uh, what does it mean to be you know, the elect? Can you talk about the elect as well? So first, are, were we all angelic beings at one time before our human state? And... What does it mean to be the elect? Yes, we were all angelic beings. We were all bright nature. We were all immortal. And it, otherwise, you would not be. you, Because your body is nothing. It's just dust to dust. You know, once we, once we leave, leave, our, leave these bodies, then it will revert back to just dust and revert back to ashes. And even the fact that when we dream... We are in our dreaming embodiment. We are in our dreaming state, and we are separate because the dream is as real as the physical world. And and when you are in your dream and you recall your dreams, it's something completely outside of the physical aspect of this world. And so that verifies to you, it should verify to you that our who we truly are is separate from the flesh and that when we awaken and we are hosting uh, by these bodies of flesh that you know we're we're just wearing the flesh body for the time that we are here but when we die we will return home back to our first estate and you know depending on how you are and what you do and whether you know Christ and whether you accept the grace of salvation to us by by him and by the Most High, that will determine as far as your eternal inheritance. But yes, we were all sons of God. We were all immortal, bright-natured angels before we uh, fell and came into the flesh. And as far as the elect, the elect are those that serve the Most High, and that fought against Lucifer in the wars in heaven. But there's also the elect that serve Yahushua and the Most High and Jesus Christ, the the Son, here in this second world age and in this flesh embodiment. And the patriarchs would be considered part of that elect. And as far as the elect that will be... um, Taken, uh, you know, when Christ comes again, those that are alive and that are in service to the Most High and to the Son in that time prior to 
what will be the rapture and you know before the wrath is poured out on those not written into the book of life those are those are the ones that will be counted as part of the elect but the elect of the first world age are those that fought against um Lucifer and the rebellious angels the one third of the angels that joined him in an insurrection and many of them um ha- won't have to come into bo- embodiment but there will be some that do and so uh, those that do come into the flesh and will be you know even like what Christ said in Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 5 um and so the elect can take take on form in the flesh and many of the patriarchs and those that are will be doing the work and will be leading others to remembrance in this the final generation the fig tree generation will also be from the elect because the father said that he would send um, some of the elect into the flesh in this the last um, generation to help in the grand awakening in the you know the spirit being poured out on all flesh and many people being brought to that awakening so that they can be led to remembrance and so that they can help others also to come to that same remembrance yeah amen praise god and also for those who are fascinated by the term uh the elect um it's there was an election process ultimately um when you do a study of of the uh word of, of the references to the term elect in the bible in the 66 book canon never mind all the stuff that zen has developed incredible expertise the apocrypha pseudo epigrapha and many other books but just in the 66 book canon it reveals some amazing things for example a lot of people out there wave the word elect around and they say they they imply that it's a you know it's a special group well kind of not so much uh it, 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 let me explain look at second timothy 2:10 and here you say here here you have paul saying therefore i endure all things for the sake of the elect that they also may obtain the salvation which is in Christ Jesus with eternal glory. What does that tell you? That there's unsaved elect. Well, if there's unsaved elect, then the elect aren't a special class of people. The elect aren't some special group. Okay, The election process took place before the foundations of the earth. All of us that are eligible, all of us who are written in the book of life before the foundations of the earth, how did that happen, by the way? How did anybody get written into the book of life before the foundations of the earth if we didn't exist before the foundations of the earth? Right. Amen? So here you have Amen. proof positive in Second Timothy 2.10, absolute proof positive, that there are unsaved elect on the earth. Wow. So there, there, it's not a special group of people that, that, that bubble up during the Great Tribulation or bubble up during the end times like so many folks think. It, it's It's all of us that were written in the book of life before the foundations of the earth. How exciting is that? Praise God. Um, Zen, uh, uh, do you want to expand upon that? Well, I think, uh, you know, you, you stated it very well. And, and yeah, it's what we do here in the flesh and the, the, the circumstances, the situation, the things that we deal with and how we example that relationship that we have with the most high with the son with the with the father uh, you, you there's so many that are even though it will still only be a minority um there are so many that are of the elect that are in body but now and are in the flesh now and i would consider even a lot that are listening to this show uh, to be part of those that are working in that aspect because how many people really in the world even are concerned with their eternal salvation that are even being led to seek out these kind of truths most people are you know totally comfortable with just going to church once um you know uh, every sunday and uh, talking about uh, prosperity or 
whatever it is, you know, that churches are teaching in this day and age. But a lot of that um, has nothing to do with the deeper aspects of the word and the gospel and the secrets that are contained therein. And when I'm talking about those things, I'm talking about the presence of the fallen angels, the how the giants were born from them, um, all the things that are tied to the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, you know, the the wars that the father and the son have waged against the fallen angels since even before the creation of Adam and Eve, uh, the destruction of Atlantis, those things that are connected to the prior times. Um, even when Joshua, you know, was led into the promised land, to take over and to rule over Canaan and the beginning of Israel when they were told to wipe out every man, woman, and child, to even to wipe out all of the cattle. And when people read those things in the mainstream churches, they don't know how to, uh, how to explain that. And many are, have been led away from Christianity because they think that the God of the Old Testament is some kind of homicidal maniac. Uh, and and so unless you understand these deeper aspects of the truth and why it was that those things were said and those things were determined to be that way and who it was that the wars were, you know, being waged against, you just would not understand. Even some of the apocryphal books, like I read this week... Um, from the wisdom of Solomon in chapter 12, where it talks about the the people of old and how they were involved in the sacrifice of their children, you know, like w- the worship of Moloch and, and Baal. And those kind of things are still ongoing in this day and age, a Bohemian Grove. Um, and the Old Testament ties what's going on in Bohemian Grove with this child sacrifice and how those people that worshipped the fallen angels and that were involved in paganism and idolatry, they also also were cannibals. They ate the flesh of humanity, and they drank the blood of humanity. And they were led astray to performing ritual in such abomination because the religion that they follow was taught to them by Satan and the fallen angels. And they incorporated this kind of things into uh, the you know these pagan religions there was a question that was asked um in one of the chat rooms a, a couple of weeks ago that they said you know what was wrong with the people of old worshiping the stars or the moon and the sun and you know there was nothing wrong with that other than you know they were taking other aspects of the creation and not worshiping the creator, but what became truly wrong with the early um, worship of the sun and the moon and the stars was that these worships and these pagan idolatrous religions were tied to the cannibalization of flesh and the drinking of blood and the offering up of children or victims, um, the splitting opening of the chest and the extractions of the still beating heart from humans these kind of abominable things that were tied to and and you know that were incorporated into uh, the way that the fallen angels utilized the movements of the sun and the moon and the stars and the equinoxes and the solstices and the times to plant seed and the times to harvest the demand for victim sacrifice and the offering of children is what made those things abominable to the Father and the Son. And so, you know, that's why it's important to understand the deeper aspects of what we're talking about and that most people still have no comprehension, no, not even any concern to coming to understanding upon. It's only a minority that has been led to truly seek and it's only a very smaller minority that has even found the answers to which they can 
understand and to read the gospel in the way that it's truly supposed to be understood. Yeah, amen. Praise Jesus. That's awesome. Well said. Um, and again, folks, if you uh, have questions or they, you have questions that bubble up or whatever, um, praise Jesus. Send uh, an email to TN, that's for Tribulation Now, TN Radio Show at gmail.com. We're monitoring that right now. Um, yeah, amen, brother. Uh, awesome. Uh, as a matter of fact, here's the thing. The longer a concept or a writing or an understanding has been around, the more time the devil has to erode it. Okay? So, again, uh, one of the, in my personal feelings, uh, as is what I believe, uh, when you look at the original, I was absolutely dumbfounded to discover that the original 1611 King James had 14 books of the Apocrypha in it on the day that it was published. And, 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 and just because, and we, we've been programmed by our own churches in many cases that are heavily infiltrated by the forces of darkness. Read the book, He Came to Set the Captives Free by Rebecca M. Brown, M.D. And you will get an inkling of how deeply infiltrated our churches are today. And this has been going on for thousands of years. Okay, so the closer that you go back to the apostolic period, the closer you come to the understanding that was as pure as one might hope to get. The longer uh, the, the the concept has been around, the longer the writings have been around, the, the longer, the more uh, Nicene councils. Look, if Jesus could stand before his own apostle and say, when after he was spoken to, and say, get thee behind me, Satan, and that was his own chosen, hand-chosen apostle, okay, then you know that Lucifer and his minions and, and, the, and the demons of darkness, if they can influence an apostle's words directly when speaking to God, Son of God, Jesus, John 10.30, I and the Father are one, all right? If that is possible, then you can believe with all of your heart that every single Nicene council, every single Ni a canon committee, every single group that ever got together to do anything to do, have to do with the Bible was corrupted and had the demons involved. You can believe it. So, again, what happened with the, 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 the Roman Catholic Inquisition? See, when you, as soon as a early religious group, an early uh, group like the Waldensians or, or the Al, 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 Albigensians, or Al, I, I always have a hard time with the Albigens, um, um, but whenever you study the ancient or early Christian groups, the apostolic offshoots, the Paulines, for example, what you learn is that their practices were far more pure and less corrupt back then because the devil didn't... So if you want to learn amazing things about the Bible, amazing things that we've been robbed of today, what you want to do is you want to find out who the Roman Catholic Church went after. Right. Because they were, you see, so when they were slaughtering the Waldensians, you want to study what the Waldensians believed. That's how you find out. That's how you find out the pure practices. Okay, you go back in time before the devil had a chance to destroy it or wipe it out. Now, this is straight from Wikipedia, and this has to do with what you were just saying, Zen. I'm going to read this. This is a quote, direct quote out of wikipedia.org about the Cathars. Now, the Cathars, the name the Cathars, that is not the name that they had. Remember that the Roman Catholics, during the Inquisition, when they were slaughtering babies and little girls and, and mothers and children in the streets of these villages back in southern France and in, in early, uh, you know, in, in around 1200, etc., during that time, when that was going on, they weren't called the Cathars. That was a name that they were given by those who wanted to disparage them. They were known as the good Christians. They were known as the good Christians because they took in all sorts of people to help them out. They, this is what it says about them. It says, in general, the Cathars were formed an anti sarcodotal party in opposition to the Catholic Church, protesting against what they perceived to be the moral, spiritual, and political corruption of the Church. Amen. They claimed that they had an apostolic succession 
from the founders of Christianity and saw Rome as having betrayed and corrupted the original purity of the message. Amen. Praise God. Listen to this. This is what it says in Wikipedia about the, the good Christians of southern France. They believe that there existed within mankind a spark of div divine light. This light, or spirit, had fallen into captivity within the realm of corruption identified as the physical body and the world. Did you hear that? That is a spirit that had fallen into the captivity of the physical body in the world. What did the Cathars know, the good Christians of southern France in 1200, what did they know that we have forgotten because the forces of darkness have stomped out that information? Why did the library in Alexandria burn to the ground? Why were the people scared for their lives and hid the Nagamati codices inside of earthenware jars in Nagamati, Egypt? Why did that happen? Why did the Texas Receptus get grabbed by several uh, uh, apostles of Jesus? And, 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 and why did they run for their lives and hide it in a monastery north of Jerusalem? Why? Because they were afraid for their lives. Because they knew that they were going to be slaughtered. Anyone who had the original understanding of, of our King Jesus back during the time that the apostles walked on this earth, their lives were in danger because the forces of darkness were trying to stomp them out and the information that they had. Praise God. Can, uh, Zen? Amen. And, and, and you know, um, when I was on the a show with the hijacker, this this was kind of funny. Uh, a long time ago, he told me that you know he was one of those fundamental uh, Christians that it, when he first heard the things that I was talking about, he would have you know back in the day and age he would have burned me at the stake. And it's <laughs> amazing that in this day and age that we can talk about the things that we talk about and not be killed for it because there was a time when that was not allowed. And and so it, it's a blessing that we can even share fellowship and dialogue and in, in question and answers in the way that we do. Um, because, and, and it's my opinion that there will be a day again, and, and who knows how long it will be, but that people will be killed for the things that we're talking about now. And in other countries, they certainly are. Um, and so, you know, it's a true blessing that we can do the things that we're doing right now. But um, I wanted to read that passage. It's only like six lines that I was talking about from the wisdom of Solomon. It says this, Those who dwelt of old in thy holy land, thou didst hate for their detestable practices, their works of sorcery and unholy rites their merciless slaughter of children, and their sacrificial feasting on human flesh and blood. These initiates from the midst of a heathen cult, these parents who murder helpless lives, thou didst will to destroy by the hands of our fathers that the land most precious of all to thee might receive a worthy colony of the servants of God." And this is when Joshua went into the land, you know, of Canaan and wiped out every man, woman, and child because these are the kind of people, um, the the hybrid giants, the sons of Anna, that they were going up against. Oh yeah, Amen. Praise God, Amen. As a matter of fact, the uh, the whole hybridization or, or pollution of the genetics and genome of mankind was going on since before. So, oh my gosh, I mean, it is like the predominant, most pervasive theme, ongoing theme. As a matter of fact, Chuck Misler even does a, a little ditty uh, in some of his teachings where he uh, explains how uh, um, all throughout the Old Testament, the bloodline uh, of Jesus, ultimately which shifted over through Mary, uh, uh, was was under attack, and uh, and right. and how the, there was a constant you know battle going on between the devil and um, and the Father, uh, you know, to try to protect the purity of that bloodline all the way up until uh, uh, the, uh, the the birth of Jesus. Um, 
Okay, so and, and real quick, I just want to uh, kind of answer this real quick question that kind of jumped in here. It's a little out of uh, synchronicity with what we're talking about right now. I'm just going to uh, answer the question for the the person who asked it. Um, uh, and, and for those of you who want to know more about this, I, I couldn't more highly recommend that you take the time to go back and listen to the radio show that we did entitled Jesus' Commandments and the Outer Darkness. The question that came in was, can you please define how many are called but few are chosen? See, that's a parable. Uh, that's metaphorical. So what? it's not really metaphorical. It's Let me explain to you like this. It's woven within the parable of the workers in the vineyard, okay? And, and it has to do with the outer darkness. Heaven is a big place, okay? There's inheritance and rewards. And Jesus was explaining through his parables that many are called – to do wonderful things on behalf of the kingdom, to be part of the marriage supper of the Lamb, to be part of the millennial kingdom, to rule and reign. Many are called, but few are actually chosen to go to the marriage supper of the Lamb. Few are actually chosen to rule and reign with Jesus in the millennial kingdom. Not everybody gets to go. Okay, It says, be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving yourselves. The outer darkness is, is a shadowy area. We covered this in that prior show. It, it, that parable of the workers in the vineyard, what, what Jesus is saying right there is is that all and we again it, it, basically the concept is that not everybody who who makes it to heaven it gets to be a metacoy a fellow uh was a metacoy on the earth a fellow uh sufferer with jesus while they were down here they, there's a lot of disobedient christians who are sitting on their hands right now and they're not doing what we were called to do Witnessing, laying hands on people, casting out devils, doing the things that we were asked to do by our king. See, Jesus can't just be your savior. He also has to be your Lord. Okay? So, again, the, these are things that we covered in that, in that particular radio show. Uh, so many are called, few are chosen. It doesn't have to do with what we're talking about. It's not the election process. That's not what this is about. What it's about is it has to do with, you know, if you if you make it to heaven, you were obviously called. If you were saved, you were obviously called. But not everybody who went up to the altar – see, read Revelation 2 and 3. Read the Church of Laodicea. If you are vomited out of the mouth of Jesus and no one comes unto the Father but through Jesus, Jesus makes the final decision as to whether or not you're going to make it. And if he's vomiting you out of out of his mouth like he does the Laodicean church, do you think you're going to make it? I don't think you're going to make it. I agree with Pastor Francis Chan that if you're getting vomited out of Jesus' mouth, you're not making it. You didn't make it through the narrow gate. Okay, praise God. So many are called, few are chosen, but th but but that that has to, that's on many levels, uh, and that's not really in regard to what the concepts that we're talking about right now. Praise Jesus. Uh, Zen, if Cain is of Satan, why does the Bible say? Otherwise, this person claims, um, this person says that, I, evident, I think it's Genesis 4.1, the individual says, And Adam knew Eve, his wife, and she conceived and bare Cain, and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Can you explain the nuances that are woven into the scripture that you have to pay super duper close attention to, to catch the, 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 the mystery of Cain? Can you explain that to folks? Sure. Uh, first off, the Bible doesn't say that uh, Cain was of Adam. And even though people allude to Genesis 4-1 uh, and, and, and say that Genesis 4-1 says so, it most certainly does not, and I'll explain why. Uh, and Adam knew Eve, his wife, semicolon, and she conceived, comma, and bare Cain and said, I have gotten a man from the Lord. That semicolon uh, separate those two individual thoughts. And there's verification of this from the the old translations, the Targum translations, that were written when the people were taken into exile into Babylon. Those translations, because the people forgot how to speak Hebrew, they began to speak other languages, and so the priests had to sanction these different translations be made. They're called Targums, and they were read in the synagogues side by side with the Hebrew Torah. And these Targums are what the people 
could understand. And in these Targums, they give clarity as to what the semicolon actually is uh, is detailing and is hiding. And I'll read just a couple for you. The other, there's like four or five different translations, Targum translations, but I'll just read a couple from Genesis 4.1 so that the listener can understand. The Palestinian Targum says this, And Adam knew his wife Eve, who had desired the angel, semicolon, and she conceived and bare Cain, and she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. A different Targum says, And Adam knew Hava, his wife, comma, who had desired the angel, semicolon, and she conceived and bare Cain. She said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord, period. And she added to bear from her husband, Adam, his twin, even Abel. The next one I will read gives great detail as to who that angel is and what the semicolon actually is hiding. And here's the final translation. And Adam knew his wife Eve, who was pregnant by the angel Samael, who's the angel of death, and she conceived and bare Cain, semicolon. And he was like the heavenly beings and not like the earthly beings, comma. And she said, I have acquired a man, the angel of the Lord. And so it Genesis 4.1 most certainly says the same thing as all of those except for the the part where she had desired the angel and who that angel was because we know him as Satan. Uh, he's the same thing as referenced in Ezekiel 28, Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, he says uh, it says that he was the abominable branch and the one that had sired the tares. Matthew chapter 13 uh, speaks about the tares as being the children of the devil. So Genesis 4.1 most certainly does not say that Adam is the father of Cain. And even in um, the Genesis 5 is where Adam's lineage begins. In Genesis chapter 4 is the lineage of Cain. And they are separated from the lineage of Adam. In in the King James Version of Genesis chapter 5, it says, it speaks about the generations of Adam. But in the Targums, it brings even greater clarity. It says this, this is the book of the genealogy of man. In the day that the Lord created man, in the likeness of the Lord, he made him male and female. He created them and blessed them in the name of his word. And he called their name man in the day they were created. And Adam lived 130 years and begat Sheth, who had the likeness of his image and his similitude. For before had Hava, who is Eve, born Cain, who was not like to him. And Abel was killed by his hand. And Cain was cast out. Neither is his seed genealogized in the book of the genealogy of Adam, but afterwards there was born one like him, and he called his name Sheth. So you see, even in Genesis chapter 5, before it gives the lineage of Adam, it says that Cain was not like him and that Sheth was born from him, uh, from Adam, and replaced Abel, who was killed by his brother Cain, who was cast out because he was not of Adam, but he was of Satan. And so when you understand this, all of the other aspects of why there's the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, all that comes to light and makes sense. Yeah, amen. Praise God. Um, 
Yeah, that's powerful. Uh and and uh it, it is. It's it's it, it it really it's the opening slam dunk for the entire story, the pervasiveness about the seed of the serpent, the seed of the woman, the whole the whole thing from the beginning. It just everything just snaps into place from that one paradigm. Praise God. So, uh, and we did have an. Uh, there was a question that's being restated uh, by Sister Kathy uh, on behalf of somebody earlier, uh, and the question was, um, "But angels were not formed from the dust, dust of the earth." And again, folks, this gets back into the concept of you have to understand that the host body of the human, the, ho- the human being, is a host body. There's arguably thousands and thousands of different kinds of host bodies out there. That's why in Hebrews it warns us that we have to be careful because we could enter, unwittingly unwittingly entertain an angel. That's completely different than the angelic manifestation that occurred in front of Daniel when he threw himself prostrate on the, on the ground because he was freaked out about what he saw. The angels in Hebrews that we unwittingly entertain that sit at our table and and have conversations with us, they're in host bodies. So again, um, the the dust of the earth metaphor is in reference primarily to the creation of the host body. Right. Okay. Has nothing to do with who we were before the foundations of the earth. Has nothing to do with what form of angelic being we happen to be during the angel wars. Okay. Our spirit energy essence, that spirit entity being that we are, spirit being that we ultimately are, light being that we ultimately are, can incarnate into multiple host bodies according to the Father's will. That's why Psalms 82 says, as a punishment, as a punishment, you, sons of God, you children of the Most High, you minor gods, shall die like men. That was God saying, I'm going to force you to incarnate into human bodies, just like the Cathars believed, just like I read earlier, and go through what we're going through here on this earth. And and if you, and and it's all over the Bible. Listen to this. Here's two examples, real quick. Matthew eleven eleven through fifteen. Assuredly, I, assuredly, I say to you, among those born of women, there is not risen one greater than John the Baptist, but he who is least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. And from the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven suffers violence. There's that war in the heavens, and the violent take it by force. Once again, the angel wars. For all the prophets in the law prophesied until John, verse 14, here's the key. And this is where Jesus, you've got to watch out for this. Jesus warns us when he's about to tell us a powerful, 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 powerful minute mystery of the Bible. He warns us, and he's doing it heavily in verse Matthew 11, verse 14. Here it is. And Jesus said, and if you are willing to receive it... He is Elijah who is to come. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. See, Jesus was letting us know that John the Baptist was actually the spirit of Elijah inside of a human body. He who has an ear, let him hear. If you are willing to receive it. That's awesome. Praise God. And then he covers it again. John 17, verses 14 through 18. I have given them your word, and the world has hated them. He's talking about the, the, you know, the apostles. He says, has hated them because they are not of the world. The apostles are not of the world. Well, they were born, in, they were born of water. They were born inside of a, a womb of a woman. Why wouldn't they be of the world? No, Jesus says the apostles were not of the world. He says in verse 15, Just before that, he says, just as I am not of the world. Verse 15, I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. Verse 16, this is powerful. They, the apostles, are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Wow. So right there, Jesus draws a parallel between himself being incarnated, incarnated into a human body and the apostles being incarnated into a human body. 
Are you seeing that? Verse 16, they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Wow. And then verse 17, sanctify them by your truth. He's praying. Your word is truth. Verse 18, as you, that's the Father, sent me into the world, that's Jesus, I also have sent them into the world. He's talking about the apostles. That is so obvious. Praise God, Zen. Christ always, when he's alluding to the, some of these deeper secrets, he always speaks uh, in, and warns us in the beginning. Like even in Matthew chapter 13, where he's talking about um, the devil having sown the tares. He gives us, in parable form, the whole illusion. Verse 25, But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. That whole parable, the enemy was Satan. And, and he reiterates it many, many times. And he says uh, in verse 28, An enemy hath done this. The servant said unto him, Without, Wilt thou then that we go and gather them up? But he said, Nay, lest while ye gather up the tares, ye root up also the wheat with them. Let both grow together. That whole thing, he re, um, says it again. In verse 34, because he's speaking in parables to the multitudes, but the apostles come up to him and ask him specifically to explain the wheat and the tares. And he says to them, I will open my mouth in parables. I will utter things which have been kept secret from the foundation of the world. So this whole thing, as far as with Cain and the devil having sown, um, you know, beguiled Eve in the garden, and that the children of the, uh, the devil are the tares, he sends the multitudes away. He explains to his disciples without any further question, explaining it explicitly so they can understand without parable and having to decipher what he's saying. And he said unto them, He that soweth the good seed is the son of man. The field is the world, the good seed are the children of the kingdom, but the tares are the children of the wicked one. The enemy that sowed them is the devil, and the harvest is the end of the world. The reapers are the angels, as therefore the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so shall it be in the end of this world. And so he's basic, he's telling you that when he comes again, the whole parable of the wheat and the tares has to do with the enmity between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, and that that has been ongoing since the garden, since the beguilement of Eve, the enemy that sowed the tares is the devil. So, I mean, if you can't understand that, uh, I just don't understand why so many don't see this. Yeah, amen. Praise God. I know. And I, Zen, how about it? I mean, when you first, I, I mean, if it wasn't for your powerful humility, I remember standing in uh, a conference room talking to you for the first time. I think it was the first time we ever talked. And um, all I knew was that you had a radio show, and to me that was like really awesome. I was like, "Wow, why is this guy talking to me?" And then um, I and I remembered saying that I didn't buy the whole Ken Klein notion that we were some kind of angels, and you had said to me, uh, uh, um, "You had said to me, oh." Oh, I, oh, I, I do, and and he said it so kind and humbly, and I, I was like, wow, I was, I, and it took, still took me several more months before um, I came around and and opened my heart. You know, there's a saying: a man convinced against his will is of the same opinion still. And I had a hardened heart to the concept, and it wasn't until the Lord humbled my heart over months of time, and once, once that happened. Everything the the Bible just came alive. Do you remember when we talked? Oh yeah, brother. Yeah, um, a long yeah. Because I was talking about not only that, but you know, the whole thing with Cain and and I was getting harassed and getting attacked and um, butchered by so many people um, back in that day because this was still new. 
and not many have been led to this discernment. In fact, the the first person that I met that um, truly was led to this discernment was Dr. Joy. And, you know, she and I became confirming witness for each other. And then we began to do videos together and did radio shows together. And uh, she had published her book, Eden, the Knowledge of Good and Evil. And, and I published my fourth book. She wrote the forward for that, uh, Lucifer, Father of Cain. And, um, and, and since that time, so many more people have been led to this understanding and this, to this revelation. And, um, you and, and Jonathan, you know, you, um, you were both led to similar discernment and you both became confirming witness also for this, this knowledge and the teachings. And, um, Jonathan was, you know, deciphering that Akhenaten thing and, uh, showing about the you know how uh, the seed had been corrupted and and then we were explaining to people about the fallen angels and the giant uh, it, it seems almost like a lifetime away you know the the beginning of really of both of our ministries and the, the work that we were we were all doing and you were only doing um, articles back then and you and Jonathan came onto my show many times and and then you guys started your own radio programs and all that just uh, took off as well. It, it seems almost like a world away. Doesn't it? I know. I, I, I remember... I remember I was really troubled, you know, just barely beginning to get my arms around these concepts. And, um, you know, I, I was still, you know, in that rejecting phase where I'm like, oh, that's a bunch of balderdash, you know. Uh, and uh, even though, Zen, I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but, you know, years before you and I talked, I had written an article called Spirit Babies. Did you know that? No, uh-uh. Yeah, I'd, I'd written an article called Spirit Babies, and I didn't really know why I wrote it, but I was toying around with this concept that was on my heart about spirits, about us existing before the foundations of the earth and being in a spirit form, and then ultimately coming down and being incarnated into, into our bodies. And I, I, yep, I called it Spirit Babies. So I had actually supernaturally coincidentally, <laughs> wrote an article that really kind of captures the concept minus the angel war part of it. So praise God. So, uh, oh, and real quick, um, one of the people is is asking this question. I'm going to go ahead and knock this one out real quick for, for this individual. Praise Jesus. And thank yeah. you for sending this in. Uh, this one here asks, uh, you know, why does the scripture say that we were made a little lower than the angels. That's really not what the scripture says. What in Hebrews chapter two, verses seven and nine, it's talking about Jesus. Okay, and uh, so it says, "What?" Uh, and this is actually a quote from the Old Testament. What is man that you are mindful of him, or the son of man that you take care of him? You have made him a little lower than the angels. This is actually a reference to Jesus from the Old Testament, and that's confirmed in verse uh, uh, Hebrews two nine, where it says, uh, "But." we see Jesus, who was made a little lower than the angels. Either way, any being that is in a host human body is automatically made a little lower than the angels. So right. there you have, by definition, we in a human form are automatically a little lower than the angels. Now here's, a, here's one that's, that's got your name all over it then. Uh, question, when we were in our bright immortal nature at the foundations of the earth did we know and have our families that we know now it's my opinion that the people that are closest to us as far as our family members those that are born of us our spouses or you know the children that we have that we were in relations with them during the first world age and that that's why we have those special relationships being reflected here in the physical uh, in that, you know, we, whether we had done work with them, not that we were born from them because we were not born, uh, you know, angels didn't birth other angels. We were all created by the father and the son, but that, yes, we had special relationships uh, working with these individuals and that those relationships are reflected in the um, the special ties that we have 
with families and those that are our closest friends, um, spouses, those kind of things are reflected here in the physical. Um, and real quick before we go on to the next two questions, um, I want to definitely get these both in. But um, can you also I, – I had a person ask me this prior to the show. Uh, if you would expound a little bit on the – and again, it's hypothesis. Not all of this can are we able to confirm. The, a lot of these are it's – a, it's a spiritual discernment. It's a feeling. It's something we feel the right. Lord placed on our heart. Uh, but we don't have any guarantees that we have everything 100% correct. So we recommend that you search this out, you seek the Lord, you pray about it, and you see what the Lord shows you. Um, I'm very surprised where the Lord brought me. <laughs> I remember that when I when I had studied I had studied the uh, Ken Klein DVD uh, that was about the uh, the the whole. Uh, well, right now you can find it out on uh, YouTube. Uh, it's called. Uh, um, the Luciferian, um, uh, I'm just forgetting it, uh, praise God. But just search on Ken Klein, the Luciferian Code, C-O-D-E. He covers most of that in that YouTube video out there. But I took that, I took notes on it, uh, the whole concept of the Morning Star office being taken over by Lucifer. There's a lot of questions in theology. How can Lucifer be over the Morning Star office and Jesus be over the Morning Star office? And, there, and why is Lucifer allowed to be alive? Well, he's on, he's, it's a type of, uh, it's part of his judgment. He's basically on a type of appeals. Uh, there's a court in, the, in, in heaven. It's the, seven, the court of the seven spirits. All of these concepts, I put them on paper and I put them before Jonathan. And you know how he, how he is. He immediately gets, goes into prayer when something witnesses to him and he took my notes and went into prayer and ended up crying and crying for uh, I mean for hours and he called me back up and he told me he goes the Lord has absolutely confirmed that yes I am or I had been at one time a fallen angel uh, or angelic being is what I prefer to use um, but anyway praise God um, here's the question my question is Cutting to the chase, because I'm a little lost with this concept. Here goes. Uh, so the teaching is that we were angelic beings, sons of God, in a prior age or era, uh, and, and, and that God let us be born ultimately as humans. Can you expand, expand on that, Zen? Yes, that's um, really, the you know, goes back to the war in heaven, the separation of light and darkness, the... Uh, the two sides coming into play, good and evil, and that uh, Lucifer, when he when he was cast out and banished from the heavens, that he came here to uh, the dark earth, uh, not first off because essentially they they were on their own planet Nibiru. We explain how all that uh, comes to play, but they are now here on on this planet, and this is the focus of you know, the whole next and what would be the last chapter uh, before the second coming of Christ. But uh, essentially, they he is parading as God and his fallen angels and him. Uh, they were leading astray uh, and also trying to create a slave race of the pre-Adamic humans that were here that were not like us. And in that they were not, they did not have the capacity that we have. But the they, you know, um, Lucifer and his fallen angels, they had established themselves as gods, as these minor gods, the the pantheon of, of gods and goddesses that we see um, reflected in um, most of the idolatrous and the pagan cultures that still worship a pantheon of gods worldwide and there's many of them that uh still do but e even after Adam and Eve came to be upon the scene then they focused on humanity and um began to intermix again and to um to experiment upon humanity and they have since our inception in this on this particular plane of existence uh have been trying to deceive and lead astray and Establish themselves as gods, and Lucifer is um, parading himself as the morning star. But the true morning star is Christ, as it says in, in Revelation, that 
you know, he is the the true morning star and that and the morning star meaning that he's the the begotten, the only begotten, the the son of the most high, that he was the one that was with the father that as you know, the visible embodiment of the father was the one that created all the sons of God, including Lucifer and all of us. And, you know, our bodies were made of the dust of the earth and the four elements of the earth, but our spirits were made of fire. It speaks about that in the second book of Enoch, that the angels, as the sons of God, that the um, that the immortal soul, uh, the immortal spirit was made of fire, which, you know, the um, sort of like light in that that aspect of us, the connecting link, um, that aspect of us, it, you know, we give our bodies warmth uh, when we inhabit our our flesh bodies, but that when our spirits die, and uh, I mean our bodies die and our spirits leave it, uh, the body grows cold. And so, you know, that's, that's what it's speaking about. And so the war in the heaven and how we all came into flesh, whatever it is that we did and um, those actions that we uh, performed and, and exhibited and uh, the our behaviors in the first world age is what led us to our current embodiment in our, you know, our incarnating into the flesh now. And for whatever reason, uh, you know, we weren't of the elect that did not have to um, come into flesh form, but that some reason, whatever that reason was, it finds us in flesh embodiment, and that we were forced to drink from the cup of forgetfulness and to temporarily um, lose memory of all those things that you know that we did in our spiritual natures, but that those memories are still with us and still embodied within the uh, our spirits and that we still have those memories and some of us um, come to remembrance on some aspect of that memory. And we remember, you know, a lot of people remember these prior lives, but it's not flesh lives where we're incarnating into the flesh over time and space and multiple lifetimes. It's our spiritual lives and the things that we did when we pre-existed these flesh forms and we were with the Father and the Son as the Council of the Mighty, as the Sons of God that were um, with you know the Morning Star administration prior to our incarnation now. Yeah, amen. Praise God. Well said. Well, well said. Um, and uh, praise Jesus, folks. We we have. <laughs> we have to, uh, I wish we had. Uh, you know what, Kent? Zen, we're going to have to do this again. Another one of these uh, question and answer sessions, real, real yeah, soon. Yeah, this is great. Yeah, I, amen. I like praise this. God. What What do you think? Uh, maybe do you want to do you want to try to line? How are you How are you doing? I know we got the. Um, uh, we're going to be doing this show with you on Revolution Radio on the 18th Wednesday. Now, we haven't heard from your producer for that yet. Uh, did you say that she was going to get in touch with us? Uh, she will call you five minutes, ten minutes before the show. Uh, all she will need is um, your Skype name or the number that you want her to call you on before the show. And, and that will be when she contacts you. It's not like she will you know, contact you weeks prior. Um, I just need your Skype names uh, that you want her to call you on or the phone numbers that you want her to call you on, and then she will contact you right before we go live. All right, praise God. Um, our, and, uh, and, and then we're going to have our normal Wednesday night show, uh, the normal Wednesday night show that would normally be done December the 18th. We're going to move it to Thursday, December the 19th at 8 o'clock. Okay, so for the regular listeners, um, just be advised we'll be uh, having uh, that show then. And uh, for the people who want to listen to the Revolution Radio Show, Brother Zen, how did they get to that? You go to freedomslips.com, and we will be broadcasting out of Studio B. 
And I will post a link on my Facebook page and also on uh, John's Facebook page prior to the show to let everybody know, and also in the Sons of God study group. So, um, But basically all you have to do is go to freedomslips.com, Studio B, at 8 o'clock Eastern on December 18th. And then we will broadcast live for two hours. Praise God. Do you want to do a a, uh, a follow-up show on the 15th? Are you available? Sure. That would be fun. All right. Praise God. So then everybody be advised. Uh, we'll be doing a follow-up show to this. So get your questions ready, and we'll roll into it. We're going to try to keep the, the first half of the show very short uh, so that we can get into more of these questions uh, and be just totally blessed by this powerful revelation. Praise God. Brother Zen, thank you for joining us tonight. God bless you. Thank you, all of you, for joining us. We're going to run out of time. The clock's ticking down. We're at the 36-second mark before the three-hour mark, so we're running out of time. God bless you all. Dear Heavenly Father, bless everybody. Father, open their eyes, open their ears, touch their souls, touch their hearts and their minds, and make us all doers of the word not just hearers of the word, deceiving ourselves. Praise Jesus. Thank you, Brother Zen, for joining us tonight. God bless you. My honor. God bless all of you. Love you, family. Bye-bye. Bye, friend.
I shall lift my obedient children to the clouds, for they shall see my glory. Let's get going. All right, we're going to go ahead and move on and bring on Brother Zen and get into the the Psalms 82. Uh, Sons of God, who are we and why are we here? This is arguably the most exciting mystery in all of the Bible. Praise Jesus. Praise God. Thank you, Jesus. Brother Zen, are you there? I am, brother. How are you doing this evening? Oh man, I'm doing good. I'm doing good. I'm I'm so glad that you're you're coming back on to share this. This is the best subject ever. I mean, we have such a large number of people that are moving, you know, they you know, some some of the people get pretty knowledgeable. Uh, then they don't, you know, they're they're not as hungry for the information, and so there's motion through all ministries. I know you've seen it in your ministry where you know you had people that are, uh, you know, that were hanging on your every word, and then now you have new people coming in and new questions bubbling up, and we're seeing that here. We're seeing a, a sizable uh, new group of new folks. Uh, last show, I had mentioned uh, seeing this motion of new folks. And that even some people uh, had not uh, didn't even realize that 9/11 was an inside job. And sure enough, uh, God bless her, uh, uh, Sister Ann, uh, who is in this area, emailed me. She was surprised. She did not realize that 9/11 was an inside job. Can you believe that, brother? Uh, yeah, brother. Because a lot of people that come to um, your ministry, my ministry, both of the work that we're doing. They have no idea how deep the rabbit hole goes and how um, how much information we bring forth. In spirit and in truth, and the Father seeketh those who worship in spirit and in truth. And then um, Paul told the Ephesians that we have to have truth tempered with love. So unless you're in that spirit, the spirit of the Most High God, this truth that's found in all of these books, especially the sacred canon, this truth is nothing but clanging symbols. So we have to be certain that we're walking in the fullness of God's Holy Spirit and just peppered with his love, and it's oozing out of every pore of our very being, or this truth is going to mislead us. There's another thing that is happening, and I'm sure that both of you are aware of it as well, is that the um, propaganda and the disinformation that is being put out by government is so in your face now that even those that have been the most asleep are realizing something is wrong and that we're not being told the truth as a collective, as humanity, uh, as the masses. And so many are now starting to seek alternative than the mainstream media. And the you know regurgitation of propaganda daily and nightly on all the news channels by all the talking bobbleheads, and so people are 
seeking for answer and in earnest, uh, in earnest, yearning for and asking for the truth to be shown to them. And when you know when they um, couple those things together, they have no idea as to you know what really truth is. And so when the reality uh, begins to uh, present itself to them. It's you know it's like opening up a massive can of worms. So, well, you know, okay, so let's, amen, and and so let's take a look at do the word of God at all. So, how do you answer the tough questions when you're sitting? You know, here we are entering into the holiday season. Many of us are going to be at Christmas parties, at work. We're going to be around people that we're not normally around. We're going to have opportunities to witness. I just sent out stacks and stacks of Tribulation Now business cards. Okay, if you want some of those for free, just email me at jbaptist777 at gmail.com, and I'll send you a stack of these cards. You can use them to witness. You know, again, aliens, demons, mega quakes, planet X, nuclear war martial law, New World Order, FEMA camps, it's all on the back of the card. Now, what if somebody says to you these questions? If God really loves us, then why do so many people have to suffer? Next question. If God really loves us, then why doesn't he destroy evil and the devil? Why are some people born into easy lives and other people born into difficult lives? Did all of humanity have to redeem itself because a woman ate a piece of fruit 6,000 years ago? Why are we born into sin? How is it possible we were sinners from before birth? Why is mankind so important to God when there are billions of stars in the universe? I feel like I had a past life. Why do I feel like I've existed in a past life? How many people out there have felt like they existed before? Look at the popularity of all that Harry Krishna stuff and and reincarnation. Why is it so popular? Why are there so many people out there that are convinced that they lived before? What about the visions? These are answers that you cannot... These are questions that cannot be answered without seeking the greater mysteries of our Heavenly Father, of our King Jesus. Now, and and so so Brother Zen, tell us, what's up with Psalms 82? Because uh, we've been on for a lot of years now. I've been on since 2008, and so that's a number of different shows that we've covered. And um, the, sometimes whatever it is that brings them, that leads them to find us, is just, the tip of the iceberg when it comes to uh, the full summation as far as the work that we've done and all of the topics and issues that we've covered. Um, and many of them, you know, have not even begun to dive into the uh, the archives and the, the full amount of work um, that, you know, we've done and, and Jonathan Cleck and all of our associations and um, in our collaborations together and being confirming witness for one another. And a lot of times the, the those that have just heard one or two shows are the most excited. And, you know, it, rather than having uh, listened to a lot of the archives and not even becoming aware of all that is out there, they will ask a dozen questions just because they're, so new to this information and uh and are so excited about the things that they are learning but the, you know they have no idea especially for those that are just beginning to be introduced to some of the esoteric subjects that we cover uh, it's 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 a lot to take in it, it can be overwhelming oh amen kenneth it is uh it is overwhelming and um the thing that I mentioned earlier about truth is a lot of people try to look at truth as just this plainer thing, black and white, uh, right or wrong, up or down. And that led to a lot of the schisms in the church and the whole Protestant movement. But unless you take truth and temper it with the Spirit, and so it's like Jesus said, you know, we're going to worship the Father. This. Um, oh, and before we proceed... For the for those of you who are new to these concepts, you might say, well, why, why, why do we care? 
Well, because, here's why. Other than the fact that, that the Scripture says in Proverbs 25, verse 2, that it is the glory of our Heavenly Father God, it is the glory of God to conceal a matter and the glory of kings to search it out. So the Father expects us to search out his mysteries. We're supposed to do it with a humble and contrite heart and as good Bereans, searching through the Bible daily to see if it is so. But we're also commanded to be wise as serpents and gentle as doves. And you can't really become wise as a serpent by sticking to just the 66 book canon. And that's what's happening today. People are waking up. They're finding out that 9-11 was an inside job. They're finding out that, uh, you know, the Oklahoma City bombing was, was not, was, was, uh, it's a setup. Okay, they're finding out that the war on terror is a setup. They're finding out that there's FEMA camps. They're finding out all these things. And that we are on the precipice of the Great Tribulation, that the United States is destroyed and that the Antichrist is running this country or Obama or whoever, you know, some of us believe that. I believe it. Now, you might say, well, I don't believe any of that stuff. I, you know, why is this important? Why are we talking about this? All right, well, here's the really, really big reason. If you are sitting, you know, we're, our job, amongst many other things, if we are to be obedient to our King, our Lord, and our Savior, Jesus, and I pray that you are trying to be obedient, is you're supposed to be winning souls and bringing people along to the kingdom. And many people, it says in James one twenty two, it says, Be ye doers of the word, not just hearers of the word, deceiving yourself. And many people don't.